Good afternoon. <laughs> welcome. I uh, would like to especially welcome our prospective students. A few of them I've seen around. I've talked to a few of them. Some of them asked me, what do I think about the program? I would say this is like my kid. is the cutest, smartest kid in the world, and this is the best program in the world. So uh, maybe I'm a little biased, but you, you got the idea. So my name is Pavlos Protobabas, and I'm the scientific director of the Institute for Applied Computational Science. This is the institute that runs the two masters program for the prospective students. Uh, so I want to make a few remarks. Uh, besides your life here at Harvard taking courses, you're going to have other opportunities here at Harvard doing research, maybe independent studies, maybe thesis, maybe the capstone. You will be interacting with not just the instructors and the lecturers, but uh, researchers in the big community at Cambridge, including the medical school, the uh, School of Public Health, even MIT, and uh, of course here at the campus. Uh, <clears throat> so. One of the things that, besides classes and research we do here, is we consider ourselves as the focal point of computational science and data science. And one of the things we do, besides, again, the programs, is to have this seminar series, and that's why you're here today. So the seminar series happens once a week, bi-weekly, and we cover many, many different topics in data science and computational science, we do invite people from industry, we invite professors, academics like Francesca, but you will have a chance to hear very different topics uh, regarding uh, data science. So, on that note, I would like to now introduce, or to be, I say I'm honored to introduce Francesca Dominici, who is a friend, colleague, and a great uh, researcher professor here at Harvard, the School of Public Health. She's a professor of biostatistics, let me, a few things. So she received her PhD in statistics for the University of Padua, that's in Italy, in 1997. Then she was a professor at Johns Hopkins University at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, she moved in 2009 here at Harvard at the Chan School of Public Health. Uh, and then she was appointed a Dean on Information Technology in 2011. 2013, appointed Associate Dean for Research, and in 2017, she was appointed as a co-director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative, which is very close to us. Uh, her research is in, I would say statistics, but statistical methods for analysis of large and complex data. Uh, she's a passionate data scientist, I will share that, and uh, she likes Complicate data, which again is part of the data science. Uh, her ultimate goal of, of addressing important questions in environmental health science, climate change, comparative effective research in cancer and health policy, but mainly today she's talking about environment. Um, <clears throat> the environment, a very popular topic these days, I must say. So we'll see what she's going to say to us. Uh, so. Please help me welcome Francesca. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlos, for, um, for inviting me. And also, I want to say that uh, you know, I really have the honor and privilege of co-directing the Harvard Data Science Initiative together with the Professor David Parks who many of you here know very well as being a professor of computer science and also one of the two directors of your master in data science. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is really about my, my own research at the intersection of statistical methodology, causal inference, but also in the context of high impact uh, policy uh, in the context of environmental health. Uh, so this is a slide of President Nixon signing the Clean Air Act in 1970. And for people that are not familiar with the Clean Air Act, this was um, a, a law that mandate, you know, this is a federal law applicable to all the continental United States, all the United States, such that we have to set what we call national ambient air quality standard, which are safety standard for the level of pollution that we breathe. And if there is evidence, 
strong data suggesting that the current ambient level of air pollution are still harmful to human health, by law, the different states have to submit to the Environmental Protection Agency a state implementation plan, and they have to act and reduce the level of pollution. And it's actually pretty interesting if you think about that in the 1970s, by signing this law was one of the first really strong position were saying that data and data science by law has to inform policy. And as a result of that, I consider this a really important success story. Not as successful still as we want it to be, but extremely successful. So if you see, these are trends of ambient level of air pollution uh, from the 90s up to 2015. Um, there is a, the horizontal line is the called the most recent national standard. Again, just think about these are safety standards. And you can see that there was a law. The law said, we look at the data. If the data said that the pollution is bad for you, we need to reduce ambient level of pollution. And this is a classical example of data feeding policy having a very important, very important results. Uh, we still have a pollution coming out of power plants, especially coal fired power plants and traffic all around the United States. And so even though ambient level of pollution has been going down in the last 20 years, the question is whether or not the pollution that we bring in the United States is still safe. So uh, through, um, you know, with a team of also involving a lot of students, um, we have been addressing two important questions, and this is, was just very recently in the last year. One was the following. Is exposure to fine particulate matter, so PM2.5 is called fine particulate matter. These are very, very little particles that penetrate deep into the lung, and is one of these pollutants that is regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. And so what we really want to ask the question is whether ambient exposure to fine particulate matter, even when the, the exposure to fine particulate matter is always below the national ambient air quality standard, so it's supposed to be safe, um, is associated with an increase in mortality risk, and whether there are some uh, um, po population that are more risk than, uh, than others. Let me say that the Environmental Protection Agency set two types of safety standards. They call it the short-term standard and the long-term standard. The short-term standards, which are set at 35 microgram per cubic meter, are basically asking whether you know, levels of pollution that you breathe the previous days, so this, try to capture very short-term effects, are harmful to human health. When the long-term standard is whether the level of pollution breathe, that you have been breathing in the last year or so are harmful to human health. And so there are two different safety standards, one on 35 micrograms per cubic meter, for short-term exposure and 12 microgram per cubic meter for long-term exposure. So talking about data and data science, so when you're trying to estimate health effects of pollution, clearly you cannot have a randomized experiment or you cannot have a clear control experiment in a way that you want. And over many, many years, and with a lot of group of people, with a lot of people, and actually with substantial time and resources, we have been organically built, I will call it, I mean, I'm pretty comfortable to say this is the largest research data platform in the world, try to link ambient exposure to pollution in all continental United States with the entire health outcome for the Medicare in the United States, as well as with all potential confounding factors. So, so in the map on the left, we have been gathering uh, all of the public available data, as well as, I will tell you in a second, estimating exposure to ambient pollution for every day, for every one kilometer to one kilometer grid in the United States for the last 20 years. We have data on power plants. So we have data of different type of regulatory intervention. We have data on traffic. Uh, so we have all kinds of information from environmental, environmental exposure. We have linked the data to claims data from Medicare and Medicaid service. Um, and I'll tell you a second, a little bit more in a second what that means. But as we, many of you know, 
Um, we only have one type of national health insurance, which is Medicare. When people in the United States turn 65, they enroll in Medicare. And so we are able to track their health. We know their, place, their, their zip code of residence. We know where they live. They know, we know age, gender, and race. We know some comorbidity. Um, and so we were able to link environmental exposure to health. Uh, and then, of course, so if you're trying to look at health effects of pollution on health, uh, you need to, con to consider all types of other confounders or other environmental factors or social factors, so socioeconomic status, so smoking, income, and so on. And so this data platform, thanks really to, to also the tremendous amount of work of my colleagues, are now, you know, has been linked, and actually some of the students in the master program, which I'm really happy about, they are, uh, they are uh, using it and they are doing all different types of analysis. So with respect to the outcome data and the health data, as I said, we have been buying over the years so these claims data. So these are, includes all of Medicare participants. So this is a study population of 67 million people per year following longitudinally and linked longitudinally for over 12 years. And actually, we have now got the most recent file up to 2015. So we know uh, the all-cause mortality, their day of death, and we know the date of every time they get hospitalized and for what. And we have some individual level information. I mean, not extremely rich, but we have some, which is the date of death, the age of entry, the year of entry, uh, um, sex rays. And also, I think it's very important, we know whether or not are eligible for Medicaid. And you know, if someone is eligible for Medicaid, it's actually a very good surrogate of, um, of socioeconomic status. So health data is huge. It's basically, I call it a dynamic cohort of 60 million people per year. Because every year, there are new people entering into the Medicaid, and we follow them. Uh, we, we follow them over time, and that is a just a general map of the enrollment. From the exposure data, there are two different types of ways that you can think about exposure to pollution. One is there are public available data, although more recently through the new administration, I'm not sure how accessible they are anymore, but it used to be public available data where you can download ambient level of pollution from monitoring station in the United States, and this is at the location of the monitors where PM2.5 and other pollutants is measured. Uh, is measured daily. One issue with this data is that, as you can see, they tend to place the monitor where there are the most urban areas, or where in the most pop populated area. And remember that now what we really want to do is to try to estimate the exposure to pollution, the health effects of exposure to pollution at a level that are very low, below the national ambient air quality standard. And so we wanted to have a very good assessment of exposure and pollution, even in areas that are less monitored or monitor less well. So one building block of which is intersect with some of the research interests of uh, the, many of the master students and the research interests of my own team, which I think this is a, one example where you can really build and scale uh, and play with as many as a prediction model and machine learning model and neural network model that you want. Because basically what we have done is build a research platform that takes ambient pollution level from monitors and then you add meteorological fields, satellite data. So actually the, the satellite have a measure they call aerosol, uh, aerosol optical, optical depth, which is an uh, unprecise measure of pollution. And then you, we have land use term, we have output of a chemical transport model, um, and other type of data sources. This is work that is led by Chen Di, who is a PhD student in the environmental health department, and the professor Joel Joel, Joel Schwartz, who is also a professor in environmental health. As part of the team, they have been building this neural network model and been training, and then they have been, um, and we have been able to estimate and predict, I would say, ambient level of pollution at one kilometer to one kilometer grid. Clearly, this is one neural network model, has a very good pre predicting ability, but I do think it's extremely exciting also for the student experience and for, you know, whoever is interested to, for, to further build uh, and train and potentially, you know, add in terms of the accuracy of this model. As you can imagine, this is a massive 
computational, uh, computational enterprise. So we were able to estimate a one kilometer to one kilometer grid for every single day for the last uh, 12 years, uh, average concentration of fine particulate matter. We linked to the Medicare population and we published this uh, um, impactful paper back last summer uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine where we conducted from a, a statistical standpoint, I would say a pretty straightforward analysis. It was a Cox proportional hazard model to try to uh, estimate the effect of exposure to fine particulate matter on the whole Medicare population. It's interesting, one thing that we're really, really interested in the journal, and this was a commentary, and there was a lot of, uh, I would say, press attention, was in this particular climate, which we know that the current, um, the, the, the current administration is not particularly interested in, in environmental issues, it was extremely important to publish a study that covered everybody, that covered the entire, the entire population. Uh, what we want to focus was on, as I said, to look at the facts for people that were exposed at, uh, um, see if I can make this work, um, for people that were exposed, I, yeah. So we were really interested to look at the study population, which is, you know, was enormous, so 32 million people. They always breed pollution level below the national ambient air quality standard. This was like the population that we had a really important focus. We have, you know, they, it was actually interesting. We had 247 um, person years, uh, and to run, uh, to run the, the, this analysis, we actually had to take the entire research computing cluster. Now, we could have done this in a much smarter way, like you know, sampling the population. I mean, from a statistician point of view, there was really no point to really try to make inference on such an a, enormous population. But from a policy point of view, to be able to say, we have done a statistical analysis that we have included everyone, it was extremely, um, it was extremely important. So what we found is that we had, in the main analysis, we have a 7.3% increase in mortality associated with um, an increase of 10 microgram per cubic meter in PM 2.5. Both of these analyses look at the effect of PM 2.5 adjusted for ozone. Ozone tends to be a traffic pollutant and the effect of ozone adjusted for PM 2.5. Importantly, and this is actually it's an interesting finding which is consistent across epidemiological study around the world. The people actually in Canada have found the similar results. They, if you take, if you try to do a statistical analysis looking at exposure or pollution, for people that are always exposed to low level, right? So these are, I call it the, the, the low exposure analysis. So these are, what's the mortality risk for the population that always breathe pollution level below the national ambient air quality standard? Not only the fact is still there and the statistical significant, but actually it's higher than, um, uh, than when we study everybody. And then we also conduct an analysis where we did not use any type of uh, estimated exposure. So we didn't fit any neural network, we just used the data that we had from the, uh, the uh, monitors, um, monitor station. And then finally, I think another important, uh, another important funding was that we wanted to look at whether some subpopulation were have higher risk than others. And so we stratified, and again, this is, was a very simple statistical analysis, and that's where actually, you know, that's now where this work starts. Uh, and we estimated the, the fact for different subpopulation, and we found the sky, you know, much, much higher risk for, for, for black, and higher risk for people that are, uh, that are double eligible, also for Medicaid, that it tends to be people that have lower, um, lower socioeconomic status. Um, similarly, and I'm just going to go this, you know, pretty, pretty fast, we also did an, an analysis that looked at the short-term effect. So I see as whether day-to-day -day changes. So the analysis before was looking as whether chronic effect of pollution. So if you are exposed to pollution for a very long time, does it increase your, your risk of that? And so you're comparing uh, across the geographical area. And so there are a lot of issues related to confounding. We also conducted what I called a time series analysis or a within location analysis 
where we look at whether day-to-day -day changes in pollution level were associated with day-to-day -day changes in mortality. And so this is also just to give a sense of the amount of data and the wealth of data. These are, and again, all of this data is available if you want access to. So these are for every, every state in the United States. Uh, this is the box plot just of the distribution of their pollution data over 12 years. And the color just to show the daily variation of the, um, of the pollution that level where red is higher and blue is lower, and that is the general trend of fine, um, of fine particulate matter. So even when, I'm not gonna go here in too much details about you know, the nuts and bolts of this, what I call the pretty straightforward statistical analysis, but the only point, of, you know, we did like a, a, a matched analysis, so I can give you more references and you can read about it, but I think what, what I wanna just point out that even if you look at whether day-to-day -day changes of pollution are associated with day-to-day -day changes in mortality, we also find a similar relationship and also we found a strong effect when the pollution levels are always below the safety standard and we look at sub, a subgroup analysis and also we found higher effect among the elderly, among the poorest and among the people of color. So all of that is done, it's actually interesting because when you do data science for policy, um, you have to include and do this massive amount of population, it's extremely important here that you do what I call it, a, a pretty transparent statistical analysis that the New England Journal of Medicine is willing to digest. Um, you can even, like even being Bayesian is, is, is kind of you know, a problem. But then really when I feel, especially you know, with this audience, where you really now have to ask yourself a lot of questions about from a data science standpoint, and I've been, am I in attainment to what I will call the highest possible principle of data science? Actually, see Shaoli, Shaoli, Shaoli taught me this word principle data science. And that's what I call, what I consider principle data science. In terms of that, I have this massive amount of data, I play with this data, I throw at it any research computing you can imagine, you know, any software you want. We publish, is out there, and now let's take a deep breath and say, okay, have we done the best that we can, right? And that's, you know, these bullet, five bullet points here are actually five different PhD theses that we are, we are working, right? And actually there are some, some students here that are working on some of these. So first of all is, from this analysis, can we say that we have evidence of causality? And actually we are under extremely, we, we as a researcher, they're trying to do statistical analysis and environmental policy are under attack by industry consultant. They're telling us, unless you can prove that you have provided evidence of causality that pollution kill people, we cannot make any regulatory decision. And you know, if you are a data scientist, so these are massive amount of observational data. Can I swear that I'm, even if I'm using the fanciest possible tool of causal inference analysis, can I say I have evidence of causality? Of course, no, no one can, right? We're never gonna do a randomized study. But yet, I think what are the principles when you do an analysis like that, that you can say, well, I've done the best I could to randomize, sorry, to, approximate a, random, a randomized study so I can feel more confident about evidence of causality. There are huge issues of exposure measurement error. Yes, it's true that we fit this neural network model and I'm sure you can come up, you know, the entire class of master's student in data science that can throw out this data, everything they can. Still, if you try to predict pollution in areas that are not monitored, guess what, you're gonna have an error, right? So in the analysis I show you, I didn't, I didn't you know, account for that, right? So how you account for the propagation of error when you are estimating this causal effect with an error that varies spatially and temporally, and especially when you are trying to do causal inference analysis of what is the effect. You just show measure confounding bias. When I look at this effect, they're estimated and they're very tremendous across different subgroups, for example, right? I, I, I show that Afro-American have a much higher effect than the other group. How much I know that's real or how much it could be driven by a measure confounding bias. So there are other variables that might confound this effect that I haven't measured. 
And there are, there is a beautiful causal inference literature and, and new contribution that we're making in trying to assess the sensitivity of this effect to a measure confounding bias. I'm gonna sh show you a specific project in a specific paper that the postdoctoral fellow of mine, which actually is here, Kansang, I'm gonna pull, pull you out. He's been working on a project that actually use um, so statistical methods to discover subgroups in the population that, is, that, are, that they manifest a different air pollution effect instead of testing. And then there is a team in my, in my group with Christine and Ben that are also here. They are really trying to deal with issue of re reproducibility and computational scalability of this air pollution effect. Because you have to think that in a certain way, and I don't want to be too, too uh, paranoid, but I'll show you actually I'm not paranoid. We are under attack because you are trying, you are making policy, that we are, we are we are publishing data science work that has a politics impact, and there are interesting parties that really wanted to try to discredit this work. And so, again, you know, in the context of data science, wherever is the project, you are not into an experimental condition, right? So we're really, when I'm thinking about the, the, the type of work I'm trying to do, this is an out of control. And then also, I think we are in a context where we are out of control, right? When you're, especially in the standard statistical training, they're saying, well, you have this, you know, independent sampling and everything's in control and you have this, I mean, come on, look at your, at the you, newspaper every day, and do you think there's anything that we can control these days? I don't, I don't think that we are. So I think it's perfectly timing for data science. So uh, this was uh, a commentary that I wrote with my colleague, uh, Corey Ziegler, in the Department of Biostatistics. This is no new methodology, nothing fancy. It's just to say, if I have data, if I have an observational data, and it's a messy observational data, and I'm trying to make a decision about whether or not pollution cause mortality or cause hospital emission, what are the main um, principle and the guiding principle about the design of the study so then I can feel more comfortable than making assessment of causality? And for people that are a little familiar, it's basically, um, you know, pretty, I mean, this is, again, it's not rocket science, but it's still something that people tend to not consider. They tend to run a seemingly complex causal inference analysis without really asking the question, what are the exposure group, what are the control group, how we divide, how we the, the divide the design phase where we do the matching from the analysis phase and pretty much a lot of the guiding principle of causal inference that Don Rubin has been uh, predicating and publishing and disseminating for a very long time. And it's actually very interesting that in a policy arena, this specific question, what type of statistic, what type of design we're using, what are the action of exposure could be, be um, compared, are we matching properly, all of these questions often are kind of gloss over, which is actually the only way which I think we can feel confident that an analysis of observational data is actually cannot ever prove causality, but it's closer to causality. There is another project that I'm working with, Zhao, who is a PhD student in the department, uh, and Danielle is a scientist, and Marianti is a faculty member at Columbia to really be extremely careful and develop statistical methodology or data science tool that account for this error propagation, right, of the exposure. So this is a really messy business because, so for example, we have, we are estimating exposure to pollution at one kilometer to one kilometer grid, but the uh, residential address is at the zip code. So we need to go from one kilometer to one kilometer grid and aggregate up to a zip code. And also there is a difference between the postal zip code and the ZCTA, which I don't know the, the acronym, and all of these vary over time. And there are 
just keep in mind there are 42,000 zip codes in the United States. So how you aggregate from this level to the other level, that's not easy. So there are computational issues, there are spatial issues, so there are error propagation issues, there are GIS issues and so on. And so actually we have people from the, from the GIS team at the QSS that have been consulting with us and helping. And then from just a methodology, um, elements is that if you're doing a causal inference analysis, and I don't know, many of you are familiar, and they're doing matching or propensity score matching or double robust estimation, how you propagate this measure of error into your causal inference analysis is also you know, an element of a PhD thesis. And then I'm just gonna uh, mention one other project, uh, as I said, with uh, my postdoctoral fellow, Kon Sang, that is here, and Dana Small is a, um, a um, professor of st 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 statistics at UPenn, both expert in causal inference analysis. And so the, the, the methodological piece here is the following, is that we wanted to, to, with this massive air pollution data, first we want to eliminate confounding, and you can do it in, very, in many different ways. What we did here, we, we eliminate confounding by doing exact matching. But then after you have eliminated confounding, what uh, it is, uh, this project we, we have been doing is also using machine learning methods to discover subgroup of the population that experience higher pollution effects. So in, in the New England Journal of Medicine, we just say, well, let's test you know, let's specify the group up front and then let's see whether or not these effects are different. We're here, what we call it, which by the way, it's going to be a team of the data science initiative, is these um, approaches to discover groups of the population that experience the effect of a treatment differently, they know instead of, of testing. So in this context, we split the, the sample into, in, in, into parts. In the discovery step, we uh, discover the group, and in the confirmation step, um, Kan Sang has been leading a project where we do non-parametric testing of uh, heterogeneity. I'm just going to skip this, but just to give you a sense of the, the, type, of the, the type of algorithm. So basically, it allows to, to discover groups where, for example, the, the, the um, uh, solid box are group of the population, subgroups of the whole population. For example, in this context, are people older than the, um, 81, they are the most elderly, and the Medicaid eligible, that have a, a pollution effect that is statistically significant, different, and higher than, um, than uh, the national average. So some of this work has received um, I mean, this work has re re received um, press, press, and, uh, uh, um, press attention from the press. Um, and I think the uh, NPR interview was particularly interesting in terms of that after I, I described the study and what was behind, on the other side was interviewed a lawyer of the Trump administration, uh, and I un underestimate, under underline a lawyer, uh, who the only thing that he said was that the study was flawed. He didn't say why or, or whatever, but that's, that was really the, the thing. And so this is the type of stuff we need to deal with. When the paper was published, this, is, uh, this gentleman is called Steve Malloy. He's actually higher up and is often quoted in the Trump administration as part of the EPA transition dream. By the way, he's a, he's a statistician. He's a, you know, I would call it a data scientist. Um, he has been basically taking the, the, the paper and try to uh, kind of pleasurize it, uh, has been accusing us of, of scientific misconduct. This is an interesting read if you want to see what are on the other side in terms of uh, environmental issues. And so that's why I think the importance of open science and rep reproducible research and all this discussion is extremely important. And that uh, there is a work that my team is leading in terms of making sure that to the degree that we can, there is open you know, data are uh, um, uh, accessible, all of the code is accessible. So there is Christine Sherratt and, uh, uh, and Ben, that are also here in the audience. So they have developing and working extremely hard, li literally day and night, into creating a, a open source framework where I'm actually really happy that some of you, the master's students are 
testing and try, and try to access some of the data that goes from their pollution data, the exposure prediction, the linkage to the health data, all the different type of statistical models as well as the reproducibility. And so all of the uh, different steps. Um, and then what I wanted to do is in the last five minutes, um, you know, this is most of the material, but I wanted to play a video if I can. And so, yes, so I'm going to play you a video just to give you a sense of, you know, I hope that will motivate, you know, this is especially the student of, of the importance of data science and what I call principal data science in the context of environmental policy and in the context of what I would call a contentious de debate. So this is a video which I'll try to play if I can. This is a video of Senator Cory Booker, a senator of New, New Jersey. He was uh, cross-examining, uh, this was at the hearing for the nomination of Kathleen Arnett White, which was a Trump uh, candidate for a member of the Council of the uh, Environmental Quality. And so let's see what he's going to say. Oh, actually, I think it's already here, right? One sec. Uh, if I, yeah, I think I just have to close this. Yeah. Last, the last five years, EPA's regulatory initiatives have been preoccupied with particulate matter as if it was a source of major risk to premature mortality. Um, I, I looked at a lot of the data and studies, and I had my staff pull just uh, to try to, for the hearing, and they pulled a, one study, which is one of the most comprehensive, really an unprecedented study that was published in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine from Harvard University, <laughs> um, which looked at 60 okay. million Medicaid uh, participants, yeah. and the study found, uh, in fact, no evidence of safe levels of exposure to particulate matter. That, that It really sounded the alarm. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the disturbing to me is how this particulate matter seems to affect low-income people, affects poor folks. Uh, uh, and as, as a result, disproportionately people of color. And they showed that the higher risk of premature deaths for African Americans, for example, are three times higher, um, three times higher. And so I, I just really um, need to understand your position on the urgency of particulate matter and dealing with this. So I, I think that what I'm really trying to get at is, do you or do you not believe that we have a crisis in, of particulate matter in the United States of America in certain communities now, especially low-income communities? Why would, when, when the bulk of the country attains the national ambient air quality standards for fine particulate matter, that, that to me um, um, is confusing if there is a crisis. Well, I, I don't find it confusing. I find it really concerning, uh, as we have a nation right now with the number one reason why kids miss school, medical reason is asthma, that we see that disproportionately in communities that are dealing with um, uh, uh, real problems with particulate matters, whether it's highways, airports, uh, CAFOs, or, or the like. Uh, I find it deeply, deeply concerning, your past statements and your inability right now to say for the record that you think there is a crisis in this country. Uh, with particulate matter and the respiratory diseases that are affecting so many of our children. So, um, you know, I think she wasn't, she, she was not um, appointed and from, um, and I'm done, from the, uh, from the Washington Post and New York Times article, it was actually pretty clear that that was, was you know, as, as, as a result of the really total lack of understanding of these issues. So I'm done here. I'm happy to take questions. But I think my, my ultimate message is, and especially for the students that are doing data science, I really hope that this motivates you to do good work, principal work, and to do work that can change the world in a positive way. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Question there. Thank you for your great talk, uh, inspiring as it was. Uh, it said you have data on all Americans, but is that really correct? Because we only took data from Medicare, which is the elderly. So we don't know anything about childhood asthma. And, uh, 
That's correct. All of, these are these are 96% of American older than 65. Now, what we have now purchased and just starting to analyze are Medicaid data. So we have bought Medicaid data. They are extremely expensive. And the Medicaid data, because Medicaid is managed by each state separately, so we got from each state. So Medicaid data includes all ages. But we are just starting, and it's going to take years so before we can say something sensible on that. Yes? Thank you for your talk. This is a really important and very timely study. I have a question about uh, compounding variables. How do you think about picking uh, socioeconomic status as opposed to, say, obesity rates or you know, health behaviors within the different regions of the study? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's one of the most complicated and important issue, confounding, right? So there are different, different aspects. So one is there are a series, and it's very limited, variables that are potential confounder that are available in the individual claims. So double eligibility to Medicaid, I think, is actually it's a great variable, right? Because it's a good element. And then also, we know every previous hospitalization they have for, for what and age range. Now, we don't have individual level smoking. We don't have screening. or So we have augmented by census area level. So in terms of, and you know, they are available at the zip code level in terms of socioeconomic variables and education and so on. So that, that's for the whole analysis. Then the other thing that we have been doing is that there is a survey, there is a subset of the Medicare population that is called the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey. So what they do is every, every three years, so they do a phone interview to a nationally representative sample of the whole Medicare where they ask actually smoking and body mass index and many other variables. And so we have done additional analysis. And again, you know, going back with methodology, are you imputing this variable? Are you doing sensitivity analysis? How you can use the information on this extended number of confounding variables to then generalize. Uh, and then, but still, there are still analyses and work that we are doing to do sensitivity analysis to a measure confounding bias because you know even if you measure these variables, there might be something else is unmeasured. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is an, an amazing question. I think that you have to do work across the whole spectrum. So when you're thinking about, often what data scientists do are, they, they tend to be excellent in one aspect, like, right? you know, so developing a new machine learning methods or new software or new methodology, right? So I think you have to do that because that is the foundation and making sure your inference, but you also have to disseminate your work. You also have to get out there and you know, publish the study on a higher spectrum. You have to, to talk to the press. You have to do you know, open science. So, and you know, it, it's hard, and that's what you bring a team together. So then you go from getting the best possible data, getting the best possible methodology, getting the best possible sciences, but also being willing to be under attack and to be able to explain to the public what are the, the, you know, the strengths and weaknesses. Now, that, that's also not always succeed. I mean, you still can get thrashed. The good news, though, is that if you build um, rigorous data and you keep publishing, on rigorous science in the long term, regardless of what is that, that judge or the other judge or this president or this other president, that stays, right? Not only stays for policy impact, but stays for the generation, for people like you in the room, that when you're studying, you can read good, good science. And I think that's, that's the best we can do in academia.
Yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have all the answer, but um, so temperature is a really tricky variable to to consider. We put a lot of thoughts on it. So for I mean, uh, temperature is a particularly important confounder when you're looking at this time series study because especially when you're looking at the effect of ozone because ozone is actually formed based on chemical reaction with sunlight. So how you separate the effect of temperature from these uh, traffic pollutants, it's, it's tricky. And again, never, never perfect. So we mostly use it as a confounding variable. Uh, when, when our interest is estimating health effects of pollution, we also have done a lot of study of looking at the stream weather event, both very cold and very hot temperature, as well as the thinking about future prediction of temperature um, under different scenarios of climate change or policy or policy reg reg regulation. So clearly temperature feature everywhere in what we do as an important actor to take, keep in mind. I think the, the work in global health, I think, is extremely important, especially because when I'm thinking about pollution in the US with, with comparing to pollution in India, I don't know how many of you, there was this incredible article in the, on the New York Times, it was probably last week, it was on the front page looking at uh, air pollution level and kids' asthma in Mongolia, where you know, the last few weeks has been the coldest weeks in Mongolia, and everyone in Mongolia, there are all sources of uh, cooking and eating, it's a coal. And the level of pollution in Mongolia were like, I don't know, 10 times higher than the national ambient air quality standard. So when you're looking at you know, places in Mongolia, places in India, places in Africa, these end, you're considering population they have no access to health care, you know, things getting extremely more complicated. Now, there is excellent work, not that of my team, but other teams, and I, I believe it also here from the, from the School of Engineer Applied Sciences, they are predicting um, both temperature and pollution level globally. Um, and again, I mean, the health data is much, you know, is much less, less refined, but I do think that there is more and more attention on these environmental issues around the world. But that's not work I'm, I mean I can claim in any way I've been contributing to, but very important issue. I see Shaoli, and then I'll get to you. Yes. So I just to understand. It's like the, the exposure response curve, it's steeper at the lower level and then flatten up. Why were those low exposures more high? No, if you just if you just try to if you just fit an exposure response curve where you look at the x axis x as axis long term exposure to pollution and mortality, the shape of the exposure response it's not linear, has a steeper slope, a lower level, and then it flatten up. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's mon monotonic, but it tends to have like, you know, levels up. And um, as been seen in the US, has been seen in Canada, has been seen in Europe independently. Why there are all different type of hypotheses and speculation? One hypothesis, there is an issue that people become, you know, that we actually, if you're always breathing higher pollution level, at some point you tend to, it's a little bit of the same challenge or the same argument of adaptation. Um, but to be honest with you, Shirley, I don't have, I don't have an answer, but that's what we're seeing. Oh, how I, how I measure it? So I know, I know the, their place of residence. I know as whether or not they have moved in the last year or so. And for every person, I calculate the average uh, level of pollution in their zip code for the past year or the past two years. And 
That's, that, that's how we measure it. That's how we... we I already aggregate at the zip code level. But PM 2.5, it's pretty homogeneous at the zip code level. Again, it's not perfect, but it's, yeah. So that's, that's what we see. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. This is, this is what I'm trying to figure out every day. So if you ask Christine and Ben, you see they're sitting there, what they tell you is that we should hire more and more people to help us to, to add data, okay? And if you talk to Georgia, my PhD student, and my postdoctoral fellow, they say we, I should hire more postdoctoral fellow to you know, uh, develop more complex causal inference methods. So. Yeah, I'm I honestly at a balanced pace. I'm trying to do both. I think that clearly for us is a priority to keep updating the data and actually literally fundraise to be able to have the resources to keep the data updated because there is like always a one to three years delay. I'm actually being switching more heavily into the data science, I will call it tool, in making sure that the data are linked and the analysis are reproducible. Higher is the impact in policy in the world. More I am tend to invest and spend more time into the platform. Uh, but at the same time, you can never give up the methodology and the foundation because you have to make sure that your conclusion is scientific um, valid. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting, I, I, yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. I think you follow the basic question that one is the data, the other is the method. And my third way you go about it is to do a good experimental design for a control experiment. Right. Have you thought about that, maybe spend energy or resources to do a very good control experiment So give me an example, because we have done many, but I'm curious what type of control design you would do. Uh, give me an example. You, you can control the uh, economics, you can control <coughs> but not go and get the data, just design it and go and get the data from the beginning. From the experimental design from the beginning. <sighs> See, the, they, you have the data, you try to figure it out from the data. Yeah. Go and get the data from the beginning as your control design. Well, I mean, when you're saying you go and get the data, I mean, you know, uh, so, for example, in, in, you know, Cory Ziegler, my, my colleague in, in biostatistics, he has, um, you know, his research program is actually more focused into specific intervention to power plants. And so then you can think more like an experiment there, which is basically saying, if we're going to shut down all the coal-fired power plants, so that would be the fact that it's going to happen you know, to pollution level, and that's what's going to so, so there have been causal study and control experiment to look at not causal effect of exposure that we are you know, experiencing every day, but causal effect of specific air quality re, you know, regulatory intervention. Uh, and so there is all of the other fields and many people have done that. So classical, a classical study, for example, that was done was when they had the Olympic Games in uh, uh, Atlanta. Actually, I showed at some point. Uh, and so they, you know, they have the downtown Atlanta and then for three weeks a day shut down completely the traffic. And so you can see how the pollution level change you know, b before, during, and after, and also, you know, you see how that um, hospitalization for asthma um, also changed. So they are called intervention study, or and there are also literature on natural experiment and, and so on. So yes, yeah, so you you can do that as well. They so the, the advantage of this is that if you have a good occasion, right, 
an experiment, an intervention, or even like um, I would call it an instrument. So that's a fantastic study because then you have a better control of confounding. The problem is then you have to have the opportunity and also that it's not generalizable because then you will say yes, the traffic ban in the uh, Atlanta Olympic Games, you know, have less asthma hospitalization where this one you can have as, a, as I would say framework to inform policy in a continuous manner. Yeah, Marisha. So you mentioned adaptation. Yeah. Yeah. And if you could see, I haven't read your paper, so I, I will, but if you could see a, a different effect depending on the age groups. Right. Uh, in other words, it, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that's something that we have been talking with, uh, with your colleague, Shirag Patel, in a long time. So clearly, this data could be linked to the Athena data, um, something we haven't done yet, but that definitely should, should be done. And, and there, there, are, you know, there are other studies that look at the exposure of pollution in, in children um, and you know, what the effects are. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>